Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. My guest today is uh, Dr. Greg Gifford. He's an assistant professor of biblical counseling at the Master's University. He got a PhD in biblical counseling from Southwest Baptist Theological Seminary, a Master of Arts in biblical counseling from the Master's University, and a BA in pastoral ministry from Baptist Bible College. Uh, he's worked both as a full-time biblical counselor and an associate pastor before joining the TMU faculty, counseled in nonprofit and local church settings. He also served as a captain in the United States Army from 2008 to 2012, and then after that, uh, transitioned to counseling ministry. So we're going to talk about his research interests and, you know, interesting things he has to say. But Greg, thank you. Yes, Richard, thanks for having me. Yeah, if you would, tell me a little bit about your transition to biblical counseling. Like, like first of all, what is biblical counseling and what made you transition into it? Uh, good. This is good. Good basis. So first of all, biblical counseling, it is what it sounds like, where we are going to take the Bible and the Bible like, really primarily, sometimes even exclusively, and help minister to people in a counseling context. And that's going to be born out of a commitment to the sufficiency of Scripture. And we believe that God's Word not only has answers, but it has enough answers to the problems that we face in life. So we take the Bible and we meet with folks in a counseling context. And sometimes that's very formal. Think of an office with an appointment. Think of uh, scheduling and there's sometimes even billing that corresponds to that. Or think of informal, perhaps more a discipleship oriented or over a coffee with God's word open in your lap, sharing and counseling in that context. So that's that's kind of the nature of what it is. The way I got into it was actually out of necessity I early in my pastoral ministry, and this is when I was in the army, I had been a youth pastor, joined the army after Bible college, and folks found out that I was a Christian. They found out that I was a pastor, and two of my neighbors actually asked if I could help. Their marriage was not great, and they asked if I would be willing to just meet with them periodically. And I had learned Greek. I had learned theology. I had spent four years studying the Bible. But honestly, I didn't know where to start in that marriage counseling process. So I, I kind of used that to help say, okay, well, if I really do believe in the truth of God's word, and I really do believe that it has answers, then I would like to learn what those answers are and how to practically take it and minister to people who really do want to hear how the Bible applies to marriage conflict, for instance. So that was really the genesis of it all. That got me into biblical counseling in a formal way and to further degrees in education, but it was really out of necessity, honestly. 
I know every situation is unique, et cetera, but any examples, let's say you, know, you have a couple and one spouse is cheating, you know, having an affair, what would be like a, an example of what biblical counseling might say versus let's say traditional counseling? Yeah. We're going to be big on understanding the why of it all. Almost everyone agrees that adultery is bad for a marriage relationship. Not too many people are wrestling with that. But a biblical counselor is going to seek to understand why did you do that and what led to a sexually immoral act in adultery. And that's the heart. We're going to try to get at the heart, what the Bible calls the heart. And the heart is, think of a control center of why you do what you do. Immaterially, your heart is the control center for why you do what you do. So in that situation, instead of just saying, well, hey, let's not commit adultery, or hey, he has needs and that's why he committed adultery, we're going to say, hey, what were you wanting that drove you to that adulterous relationship? And were you wanting more than you want to honor God in your life? Because that's the reason why you went to an adulterous relationship to begin with. So yes, adultery is sinful and wrong and damaging and destroys trust. Yes, yes, yes. But the root issue is, what were you worshiping more than you were worshiping God in that moment that led you to commit adultery, for instance? I would guess that if someone's strong in faith, they tend not to need a biblical counselor. Can someone still be strong in faith, but yet do these? Can someone be strong in faith and have a bad marriage? Or if you have a bad marriage or a problematic one, is it incredibly likely that your faith needs work too. I think it's very possible to be strong in faith and have a bad marriage because marriage takes two people to invest in the relationship or the marriage to be healthy. You could probably think of many, many ladies in the local church, their husband does not attend with them and yet they are vibrant women in Christ and their husband isn't really a, a believer or strongly committed to Christ if he is makes no significant effort for their marriage, and yet they themselves are growing in Christ-likeness and spiritually mature. So I would say, yes, if you are the one that is not contributing to the marriage, then yes, it's going to be hard to make an argument for you being good with the Lord and bad with your spouse. But if you're married to the individual who is struggling, if you're married to the individual who intermittently attends church, then I think you can grow vibrantly in Christ, even though your spouse is not doing so and or contributing to the marriage. But how, like if one is, one person's of faith, the other one's not, or one person is, uh, you know, has strong faith, the other one has barely any, is it possible for the marriage to get better without both of them coming to strong faith? Maybe in one sense, but not in the ultimate sense. Maybe in one sense of learning how to, you know, the think of the topical or think of the fruit issues is what we would call them in biblical counseling. You can learn how to talk to each other in ways that are respectful and kind. You know, you can learn how to listen in ways that are helpful. And those are more skill-based, but they're not really getting to the root of the issue of why you are a bad listener. or Do you want to honor the Lord in your listening or in your speaking? So I do think in a skill-based way, you can alleviate suffering and you can help contribute to a common good. And a person's not a Christian and yet they, they want to be a better communicator, for instance. Yeah, you could do that. So in one sense, yes, but in the ultimate sense, no. If you're not growing closer to the Lord, then it's like you're just fruit swapping to a certain degree, or it's like you focusing on the behavior, but you're not really focused on the reason why the behavior is occurring, and that is your relationship with the Lord is strained, so you have more communication in that way. Have you been able to successfully help couples where one person just is not a believer and the other one is? Or do they both have to, I guess, you know, the nature of biblical counseling, like uh, do secular people agree to do it? And if so, do they do it half-heartedly? Yeah, good question. The answer is that most of the people that are not Christians and they come in for biblical counseling are there because someone else wants them to be there, in all fairness. A spouse, a parent, generally speaking. And that's kind of the nature of what we do. I mean, number one, we're biblical counselors, so you know that we're going to share the Bible in our time together. So if you're not committed to the Bible, you're not committed to Christ as Lord, you know, you're not seeking to honor God, then you're, you're probably not Googling, where can I find a biblical counselor, number one. But then number two, yeah, as a person comes, we are going to share the gospel and we are going to get to the root of what's taking place and why they were actually created to honor the Lord and created to not only honor him, but to, when you honor him, it brings the greatest joy and satisfaction you can experience. And if a person does not want want to become a Christian, then it doesn't mean we say, all right, boom, counseling's done. We just say, well, there's still going to be that main dominant root issue, but let's see if we can help equip your marriage with just some practical tools that are all still pointing back to your need for Jesus Christ or all still reminding you of the blessings of keeping God's word, which Psalm 19 promises. What will happen in a typical biblical counseling session? There are uh, stages to it, or is it more free-flowing? Like, what, what does it look like? Yeah, we train in what's called key elements. 
And there are different organizations. You may have heard of the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors, and they're the biggest one. They're the one that I'm affiliated with. And what we do is we submit ourselves to a standard of conduct and a doctrinal statement. And in that, you're trained in a methodology, and that methodology helps give you a structure for your individual counseling sessions and the progression of your overall counseling session. So it, it shouldn't be free flow. You know, you shouldn't feel like your counselor is disorganized and all over the place. There should be an agenda and there should be a structure to what they're doing. Okay, but what does that agenda typically look like? Like what does a standard session look like? First session is going to be primarily about understanding and gathering data, instilling hope, giving hope is what we will call it. Moving from a first session to a second session, you're typically going to get to the heart of the issue and trying to understand the root of why these things are happening in this person's life. And biblically, that's your inner person. And we're helping people see how God is, through his word, framing their circumstances. And so you'll even hear the idea of interpreting the circumstances biblically, because we want to help say, all right, you're calling it a communication problem, but here we're trying to help you reinterpret what's happening biblically. Then after we've gained a commitment from there, you know, hey, you're okay with that. You agree with that. Well, here's what we do next. We want you to first and foremost, please the Lord, and then let's discuss how you do that practically. So your next sessions are primarily going to be about instruction in the scripture and then practical implementation or giving homework. And that may be, you know, eight to 10 sessions over four months, five months, something like that, six months. And then towards the end of counseling, we're not trying to give you any more information. We're just trying to ensure that you're taking what we We've taught you and you have integrated it into your life. So we're going to measure homework. We're going to get you accountability. We're going to make sure that you're in a local church. And slowly, if those things are happening, then we reduce counseling and then graduate you once those things are fully in place. So maybe nine months and 12 sessions or so, you know, as a typical expectation. And that structure is loosely like what I've just described to you. Has the Bible been annotated for the top issues that couples face. I would guess, you know, there's always a Pareto of issues and probably go and find relic, you know, let's say it was adultery or I don't even know what the, what are, like, what are the common issues, first of all? Right? Yeah, sure. Adultery, you know, that's the more serious and usually it's just conflict. You know, conflict is one of the most prominent marriage issues. When you're thinking about conflict, that could be everything from just disagreement. You know, we're not communicating well. We're getting an argument. You don't listen to me. You don't seek forgiveness. You know, you don't ever, you don't ever admit you're wrong. Think of those types of conflicts. And then on the individual side, a lot of it is really generational. You'll see like a lot of the younger generation, my students, it's depression and anxiety and it stinks, but that's the majority of where they're at. Ladies, often it's anxiety. And then guys, there's a lot of purity issues. And unfortunately, that's related to pornography for the younger guys. As you get to different seasons of life, it seems that not that there are generational sins, but that there are things that one generation struggles with that the next generation doesn't as much. But I think the top issues are going to be purity, anxiety, depression. So has anyone gone through or, you know, you or the biblical counselor has gone through and annotated the Bible and found passages relevant to those kind of issues. So it's, yes. it's fast to do it from scratch each time. Yeah, it's like the, you know, the Cliff Notes version of that particular issue. And there's a couple of ways. Those things can be helpful because it's a quick reference guide. And I think that's actually what it's called. It's a, it's a spiral bound book, a quick reference guide. And then you go and look up all the verses on anger, for instance, or anxiety. And that's helpful. As a biblical counselor, we want to train you how to think like a biblical counselor instead of just giving you the answers to the equation. So it's like in math, you know, I could say, well, I know two plus two is four, so I just write four. But my teacher wants me to show my work here. In biblical counseling, we want you to learn the Bible so that when you experience, excuse me, that problem in counseling, you can do the work and you can come to your own answer without just being told what the answer is. Okay. How much further do you have to go over and above the cliff notes? Like, I guess you got to bring it to life and then also link it to that particular couple's context. So I guess, yeah, I guess it's like an outline for you. I guess you take it from there and then you expand upon it to people. Yeah. So think of it this way, Richard. Think of it like there is one biblical counselor said it like this. He said, some consider biblical counseling like another marble in the bag of marbles. And so, yeah, their Bible has answers about anger and why the husband shouldn't be angry toward his wife. Yes. But what we believe in biblical counseling is not that Bible is just one additional marble to the bag, but the Bible is the pair of glasses that you're wearing as you look at the bag of marbles. It is the worldview that you are framing this problem from God's perspective. That's people. That's how they change. That's the purpose of life. And that's all of it. 
So if I'm just using the quick reference guide, I can go grab a verse from Proverbs that talks about being quick tempered and how a fool gives full vent to a spirit, but I haven't necessarily viewed the entire problem through the lens of scripture. So typically that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to not only frame the answer, the why, frame the way that you change, frame the purpose of change all through the lens of scripture. Can you give a, an anecdote or a story and what you said to the people, again, in short form, abbreviated form and what happened? Yeah. Yeah. Just in terms of like a counseling example of this. Yeah. I think you, this will make sense. So think most marriage counseling, we get an intake form and they say something like, you know, we have communication issues. We have finance issues, disagreement, and then there's the sexual intimacy stuff. So let's just use communication. All right. Technically, when, when I'm meeting with that couple, I could say, look, let's go to Ephesians chapter four. And it says that you're to speak the truth in love. Verse 15. Verse 25, you're to put off falsehood. Yes, yes. Verse 29, you're to use edifying words. Ephesians 4. Yes, perfect. But that is more of the quick reference guide as opposed to me stepping back and saying, and why are you using words that are not edifying, not loving, and perhaps even untruthful? Why are you doing that? That's us using the scripture as the lens through which we're viewing everything. We're going to actually interpret people through the lens of scripture and why you do what you do. And then we're going to interpret the problem through the lens of scripture. And why is it a problem? Why is that a sin? Or why is that not a sin? We're going to interpret the way that you should change. You know, is this just, you need to learn some new vocabulary or have you sinned against the Lord and your spouse in this process? And not every counseling issue is a sin, just to be clear, including communication issues. But now that's totally different from me jumping to Ephesians 4. That's me helping interpret this whole problem. So when I do that in the counseling case, oftentimes I don't even have to tell you the things you should be saying. When you get to the root of the issue, the why, then you know how to clean up your language in such a way that it honors the Lord and blesses your spouse. I don't have to tell you what to say. That is the, that's an example of how you frame, you reframe this whole thing through the lens of God's word, the scriptures. When people go through the biblical counseling, do you find that they're, I guess, personally in sin in their life? I guess you said sometimes it's not everything is a sin and we don't need it, but I guess most of the time are people, I guess, in general in sin? Are they having a problem, like some kind of addiction or some kind of serious issue that's causing this? Or it's all over the place and sometimes yes, sometimes no. Yes, exactly. It's the latter. I mean, I think it's going to depend a little bit on the pocket of the world that you're in, a little bit on the type of people that you find yourself meeting with. You know, if I'm based in like an addictions recovery context, it's going to be maybe a little more sin oriented. But if it's just a, you know, a nonprofit counseling center, like I, I was at in Charleston, South Carolina, it's kind of this mixed on ramp of folks. And so usually what we'll say in biblical counseling is it, it's sin and suffering. You know, there's sin and suffering. Most people aren't reaching out because everything is well in their life. Most of the time there is a problem, although there is this unique idea of kind of like a biblical coach, someone that's going to help be more of a coach and an encourager to you. And there's not really a problem that needs to be fixed. But most of the time in biblical counseling, it is problem oriented. And the problem, it could be created by you, which would be a sin, or it's sometimes created by others, which is the suffering aspect of our sanctification. Okay. Any interesting or surprising stories of, uh, you know, couples that you run into, like you just, you're amazed by either the positive result or the story itself? I think you will see, this is something that the world is not going to be able to articulate well, that you will see that God uses interpersonal problems to actually help us be more like Jesus Christ. And so here's going to be the surprising thing. What if God uses conflict to help us learn to trust him more and to glorify? Most of us don't enjoy interpersonal conflict. I know I don't naturally. I would like everybody to get along. I'm not a huge fan of arguing with my friends and so forth. But I know in times of conflict that it can be a means of helping us learn to trust the Lord, learn to walk by faith, and learn to seek to glorify Him, even when other people are not happy with us in that exact moment. So now you can say, look, in this context of sin suffering, if you're not sinning against the Lord, and yet you're going through this difficult interpersonal conflict, that suffering is used by the Lord to accomplish His will in your life, which is greater Christlikeness. So instead of me thinking I'm a failure, instead of me thinking that life is hopeless, I can begin to think, you know what? If I'm responding in a way that honors the Lord, that gives me great hope. And now I just trust him. I should trust him with understanding that if I'm doing what I'm called to do, then however that person responds to me is really between them and the Lord. I'm going to still do good to them and honor the Lord in my response. So my response is, it's actually different when I know that this immediate personal relationship may not be mended. God may use the difficulty of this relationship to help me trust 
trust him more. And in the end, that is a win in my life that I'm honoring the Lord and trusting him. Have you seen, I guess, in a counseling session, sometimes it doesn't resolve or work out, but yet people are helped anyway? You know, let's say it leads to a divorce, but, you know, uh, six months or a year later, they're both doing much better than they were before. Yes, totally. You'll see that from a temporal angle, sometimes the circumstances really don't change just a whole lot. You know, you're you're perhaps still at that employer that you're not super thrilled about. You know, think of family conflict. Your family hasn't changed dramatically in nine months. And yet you are growing and you are different right in the middle of those circumstances that are the same. And why is that? Because you're now actually framing this through the lens of Scripture and what God would call you to do. So the transformation happening in your life is not circumstantial. It's that inner heart transformation that's changing you right in the middle of circumstances that haven't changed, or they haven't changed significantly at least. So yeah, you see that all the time. And that is part of the goal of the biblical counselor is to say, look, we don't want you to sell your house and move cross states and change all your environment. We want you to be changed right in the middle of your environment. And if the Lord wants to change your circumstances, and sometimes we want him to do that, praise him. Like, great. We want him to alleviate work tensions. We want him to provide a better job, of course. But even if he doesn't, you can be more like Jesus Christ in this time. Okay. What do you do if one person's of faith, the other one's like atheist, agnostic, they just they have no interest. Can you still help? or You can. It's a little bit different because it's not so much marriage counseling in that way. What you're trying to do is to equip that believing spouse, whichever one it is, if it's the husband or the wife, you're trying to equip them to be the aroma of Christ. That's the way that Paul says it in Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. He says, thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. I, I don't want this to be overly reductionistic, but we want your testimony before your unbelieving spouse to be a sweet aroma of Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, the believing wife influences the unbelieving husband through her conduct. So you are evangelistic in nature. So what's our goal? Well, we're not necessarily talking about marriage. We're talking about you being the aroma of Christ to your unbelieving spouse and how to be a spiritual influence to them. And if you're willing to hunker down in that, the Lord often uses your godly conduct to influence your spouse toward faith and repentance, especially as husbands. You'll see, Richard, that if God saves the husband, oftentimes the rest of the family comes as well. There's something about the leadership of a man. Whenever he is converted, God regularly uses that to get the wife into church and get the kids into church as well. Is it more common that the husband will not be a saint or the wife? Or In my experience, it is that the wife is the faithful one and that the husband is uh, maybe a professing believer, but just doesn't go to church anymore, or maybe not even a professing believer and just kind of thinks the church is a good thing for her and the kids. And so he doesn't really interfere with her going. Yeah, it is interesting. It's interesting because you think he knows church is a good thing. Uh, I was reading a Wall Street Journal report how a lot of the millennial generation and the generation just ahead, I think it's the Gen Zers, they are leaving the church after their children graduate from high school because what's happening is they were never really connected. They just knew church was a good thing for their kids. Why? Like, why would they think church is good for their kids? And then, first of all, expect their kids to remain in faith. You know, why don't they do it too? Yeah, right. I mean, but it does speak. It speaks to that internal inconsistency, number one. But number two, it speaks to... There's a benefit. Even unbelievers will say, you know, like going to mass is good. That's a great thing. You should do it. There's nothing bad about it. Or going to church can be good for you. You know, there's a there are pockets of the world that still believe that church is good, even though they themselves don't participate. Well, it's just kind of odd, I guess. I don't know. You know, I don't disagree with that. I guess maybe it's like, oh, my son plays baseball. I don't want to play baseball, but I know it's good for him. Maybe it's because they think of faith too casually, and that's why. Yeah, maybe. I mean, we all have certain things we know would be good for us to do, but we we're simply not doing them, you know, sleep better, uh, maintain a more healthy diet, you know? So it's like, yeah, I think we all have a level of that, that sometimes we are living out inconsistently. And then there's a pocket of people that do that. So in the biblical counseling context, it's usually the husband that's like, well, I'm not going, but you can take the kids, obviously. You yourself go to the women's Bible study and, and I'll just stay home and watch basketball. I'll stay home and watch porn. 
Yeah. You know, something more sinful and overt, like you've mentioned. Interesting. Okay. How long have you been doing the biblical counseling and what trends are you seeing if you've done it for a number of years? Yeah, I'm at 15 years part-time or full-time. So it's interesting because I'm embedded a lot in an undergraduate context. So I do think that skews a little bit of my experience, but I also am counseling through my local church here in Santa Clarita. And what you're seeing is this burgeoning of purity issues, which is technologically oriented, right? So that's pornography or online correspondence, some weird misuse of the good technology God has given to us. So you're seeing that in anxiety. Honestly, anxiety seems to be this new trend. And you wonder, and I've speculated on this, Richard, I don't know if I could prove it, but I, I do think that the mass information that we have through technologies, the decisions that we're making now as young individuals that then become 20-somethings and 30-somethings, that we have more decisions to make in our modern generation than most other generations have had to make. What's our career going to be? What's our college degree going to be? Where are we going to live? What house are we going to own? And that's creating the sense of out of control anxiety and fear at times. I think also there's social media use and uh, being able to compare yourself to other people. Exactly. Or LinkedIn. I mean, think of our generation. Like, we're dissatisfied in our jobs, so we go on LinkedIn and we just see what Indeed.com has going on right now. And then we're kind of dissatisfied and that leads us to researching other opportunities and so forth. So that information isn't necessarily helpful. Instead of us saying, I need to be content in the job the Lord has given me, we start to think about the next thing and how do we do that it's through technological advances. So what so you're saying technology is really reshaping the people that you work with? Right. And that seems to be the predominant thing that's changing them. Yes. And the, I guess the locale, the part of the world that I'm counseling in, I think as the technology has gone, and this includes some of the LGBTQ plus stuff, as the technology has gone, so as going the culture. So what, I don't know, are there new defenses or new things that you can do or well, like, what do you do? Well, I mean, you're dealing with a problem that's not that old, number one. I mean, what? Are, how old is the internet? 70s? And so you think... Commercial use. But yeah. Right. So you're, most of us didn't, when you had the dial up modem you know, in the 2000s, and it's too slow to do anything on, so you kind of lose interest. Actually, I was on the internet first as a 1988, and I had a dial-up modem, and it was just text. Right, so, I mean, that's that long ago, in all fairness. It feels so, like it. Sometimes it feels like it is, sometimes it's not. Yeah, I know, a new generation. I was at a pizza place last night, and they were playing 80s music, and I was like, all right, yeah, these aren't the oldies, are they? But I think this is a new phenomenon. This is the technology of our generation. You know, each generation is going to face its own technological advances. But we're facing the ubiquity of information and the effects that that has on us as people. And so now we're having to learn how to take God's word and to interact with those modern developments and then apply that to social media and body image stuff. Contentment and LinkedIn slash Indeed. Purity issues that can come through technology. Escapism. And I don't mean this in a negative way. I mean the person that vegetates in front of their Netflix or Disney Plus account for hours. And, right. They're just checking out and finding that uh, refuge, that digital refuge. So our generation is being affected through the technologies. And so what we're having to learn to do is to interpret how should we respond. And and just note, myself nor other biblical counselors are saying you need to cancel all technologies or you need to get rid of televisions and smartphones and streaming services. We're not saying that. We're just saying that we want you to approach it the way God would have you to approach it, which is to see yourself as a steward and those as conduits of information. And you're going to intentionally engage them and not let them dominate you. So what would be an example like of proper use of Netflix or TikTok or whatever it is versus, or is there no proper use? There's some debate that about TikTok, but I'm not as familiar with that as a platform. In general, think of First Timothy 4, verse 4, for everything created by God is good. Nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it's made holy by the word of God in prayer. Even that's true for technology. Technology is not inherently evil. And you could say what you want about certain channels or certain platforms or certain technologies, but in the end, it's not inherently evil. It's the utilization of it that can be evil, which also means the utilization of it can be God honoring. Uh, so if, if you and I were in Paul's era and he said, hey, bring me the books and the paper, there's some technological advances there through a printing press or through papyri that you could write on and distribute. There, That's technology, so to speak. Hopefully, even 
even the listeners to this podcast are engaging technology in a way that benefits their own sanctification because they're hearing you and I chat this through and they're hearing the word of God go out through technological means. So big picture, I think the inner person that wants to reject and move out into the wilderness and live off the land and cut off all technology still hasn't really dealt with problem, which is how should you engage it in a way that glorifies the Lord? So you're moving then from, it would be easier to just go to Alaska, live off the land in one sense, because you're not having to interact with all of the drama that comes with technology. But in another sense, you haven't really addressed it and you haven't dealt with your own heart and your own heart's engagement of it. So a wise use of technology is going to look something like stewardship. It's not consuming you. You're not always on your phone. You don't feel incomplete without it. Purity, that you're honoring the Lord in what you're looking at. The Lord is your refuge, not your technological platforms. You, you go through productivity or you go through the fruitfulness of your time and you begin to think, what is it that Greg or Richard can struggle with when engaging in technology? L using the lens of scripture, let's think through what God would want us to do in regard to that struggle with technology. I guess you can go on YouTube and watch sermons, go on YouTube and watch, uh, you know, I don't know, terrible stuff. Exactly. Right. You can Google positive, sanctifying, helpful, biblically clarifying information. There are online Bible platforms. You have a podcast. I have a podcast. Lord willing, people go on and they use that conduit for God honoring purposes. Yeah, that's great. Oh, you, you said you have a podcast. What is it? What's the subject? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I may not stop talking, so feel free to just. Right. I've been a part of a project called Transformed. And what that means is we actually record live biblical counseling with actual people and their actual problems. And that has turned into a TV series. So we've done three now. And Gospel Partners Media out in Atlanta bring me in once a year to meet with folks. And these folks are very gracious and kind to really open themselves up in front of a live audience or in front of a film crew that records what they're going through. It's called Transformed, which is also the podcast that I host. So weekly, I'll release biblical counseling content to the person that is interested in hearing what God's Word has to say about the problem they are facing. TV show, podcast, all that's called transformed. So instead of like uh, Dear Abby, you could say Dear Greggy if you want. It's really cool. It's interesting. Yeah, it's cool. Richard. The Lord's been very kind because sometimes I just I assume people know that, and when I say it, I'm like, yeah, I know. As you guys know. But other people have not thought about it, or or maybe they've been actually meeting with a Christian counselor, and they've never heard what the Bible has to say of their experience. There's another question back from a little while ago. Have you had someone that was, you know, secular come to faith in Christ because of the counseling? Yeah, what you'll find is that the majority of people that are coming that are not Christians, they're attached to, you know, the family member, like I said, the spouse, the parents, whatever that is. But there are a group of individuals that are open, but skeptical. You know, open, open knowing that God has answers, open knowing that they should be more connected to a church. And so they hear a biblical counseling and they think, well, that's probably the right path for me. And through that, you're able to share the gospel with them and help connect the redemption found in Jesus Christ with the core needs of their life. That is what they, they ultimately need forgiveness. So do I find that to be a regular occurrence? No, I don't. And I, you know, I think part of it is because most people that are seeking biblical counsel are already committed to the word and they're already committed to Christ and so forth. But I, I again, go back to the people that know that church is a good thing or the people that know that the Bible has good things to say. Those are the ones that we often get to connect the dots and say, hey, with clarity, the Bible not only has the answer to the problem you're facing right, right now, but also the larger problem you're facing, which is your need for Jesus Christ. I guess one thing that, you know, I'm not trying to, trying to tell you how to do your job because I don't know. So, you know, I, like the Bible is not just a book. It's a system for living well. One of the other things that is like a mini library of, you know, of fantastic teachings. So is that communicated as part of the process or is that not really necessary? Or? Yeah, I think that goes back to the lens, you know, that the Bible is the lens through how you live your life. What does it mean to be so breast? What's it mean to be men? What does it mean to be hard workers? If we're married, what's it mean to be a husband or a wife? And yeah, all of those. And and those are, that's the lens. You're thinking through those roles according to the lens of scripture. Totally. And so again, I think if a person is not a believer and yet they're willing to implement biblical practices in their life, to one degree, we say, great, praise the Lord. Now, you know, we want you to benefit from God's wisdom. But at another degree, we also want to point you back to your ultimate need, which is 
that you need to follow Christ and you need to turn from your sin and seek forgiveness and be restored to God through Christ. I don't know. Any other interesting things that have happened maybe to you or to, to the people that you minister to in Bill Counseling? Any any crazy stories? or? Well, you're going to give me an open space to talk about whatever I want. I appreciate that, Richard. I'll steward it here. You're a brave man. Tell me some shocking biblical counseling stories. Or something. War stories with Dr. Gifford. Here's something that I think is worth noting. And I'm finding it more and more and more. It's the idea of expressive individualism. And it's interesting because what it is, Charles Taylor, philosopher, sociologist, he began to note that this is more of the age of authenticity where people really appreciate the the younger generations, appreciate you being an authentic person and living in an aligned way with your inner feelings, emotions, perspectives, and so forth. So that moves from being authentic to expressing it. So you're familiar with individualism. Then what expressive individualism means is that you have to be affirmed in what's your internal experience and your feelings should be affirmed. Your perspective should be affirmed and respected. And anyone that interferes with that is actually hurting you, hindering you. Rousseau would say they are the chain and you were born free. So what's interesting to me, Richard, is this age of expressive individualism and all of the ways that that's beginning to affect us. We think we internally have the best answers, and over time, we reject those that disagree with us. That has massive counseling implications. That has massive work implications. That has massive relational implications. If we don't humble ourselves to people outside of us, but instead see them as toxic, cancel them, remove them from our life, because internally we have the best answers and they need to support us, affirm us and whatever that looks like. So yeah, as of late, that's been really fascinating. I'm teaching in a lot of men's conferences coming up here in the next three, four months. And I'm doing my best to help these guys understand expressive individualism and how that's shaping us as men, whether we're godly men, ungodly men, excellent men, or normal, regular, average, maybe below average men. How do you view yourself as being right? Or do you need someone else to speak into your life to help you grow in excellence in Christ's likeness? You know, some of these conferences, uh, any recommendations on ones that are coming up you know, for listeners? Yeah, uh, definitely. So there's one coming up, depending on when this is released. We have one in October at Faith Community Church in Newhall. We have one in Bakersfield that's going to be a men's conference, and that is going to be just before Christmas of 23. And then another one is going to be in April in Seattle. And so your listeners, if they're if they check out Transformed, or even if they just do some basic Googling, they'll see my name and these men's conferences start to come up. Okay. For women of their conferences, or is more the focus on men? There are women conferences, but I'm not the speaker at those conferences. That's true. <laughs> I would not feel comfortable stepping into that environment, speaking in and <laughs> the lady might be struggling with. Yeah, it's you know, it brings truth to power to uh, you know, that havoc. Ask my wife or ask, you know, a female biblical counseling professor here. Well, okay, well, very good. Well, Greg, what's the best place for people to reach out for help if they want biblical counseling? And, you know, if you could restate the podcast and other ways that they could find out you know, the resources you have at the conferences, like what are other places people can go? Two places. The first is transformed.org. And that would be the first stop that I would make. There's not only a location for biblical counselors, we have a library, there's an online store, you'll get snippets of the videos and the podcasts. So that's transformed. The second is if you go to drgifford.org, you'll see a little bit more of just the schedule of speaking engagements that are coming up, posted resources from prior speaking engagements. So between those two websites, transformed.org and drgifford.org, you will know all there is to know about my life. Okay, very good. Well, Greg, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate everything you've talked about. Thank you for having me. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. 
This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.